Hi there, Lindsay here. Can you hear that hum? That lovely, lovely hum. We are being lulled by the sound of my space heater, which is the first tip I have in setting up your craft room in a non-heated portion of your home. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. This is actually the second time I've tried to film this video. I uh, took a crack at it last week, but I wasn't happy with the way it was coming out. Um, so I hope this is gonna be a little bit more condensed and to the point and hopefully give you some really practical tips. So what I'm talking about where I'm talking about unfinished area of your home, I'm talking about a space basically nobody else wants. That might be part of your basement, an unfinished basement. It might be attic. It might be a shed on your property. It might be part of a porch, hopefully like an enclosed or screened in porch. Um, any place like that. Now if you, uh, you could definitely find a spot within your home, that's great. Put a card table in the corner of your bedroom or a den or something like that. That will work beautifully, but if you're like me, there were no spaces like that that I could take over. We live in a fairly small ranch style home. I used to use one of the bedrooms as my home studio when I had a, a studio I rented in Bangor where I taught uh, classes. Um, so when my twins came along, I decided to close the business because I wasn't gonna be able to bring three little toddlers up uh, two flights of stairs with me every day and teach and just, I couldn't juggle at all. So I decided I would take a break, close the studio downtown, and um, you know raise my babies because I didn't think I'd have too much free time because I already had one kid, one baby, so I knew that yeah they take up a lot more time than one would think. So I just knew it was going to be a couple of years of of not um, uh, not being in business. And I at the time, like I mentioned, had a bedroom studio, and all that stuff had to be taken out, and I just basically put my supplies in any nook and cranny I could find throughout my home, my closet, even the powder room in my master bedroom was like to the ceiling. I had bins to the ceiling with art supplies in them. So as soon as I had a chance to uh, take over part of the basement, I did. Now when I say as soon as I have the chance, it's because when we first um, when we first bought this house, there was some issues in the basement. We must have bought this house when there was a drought because the basement was dry when we bought it, but every year it seemed to get a little wetter. So what we ended up doing was investing in a basement. Um, the company was Basement Systems, and I believe that's a countrywide company, um, like a franchise. It was a big investment, so I just want to say that right off the bat. Um, however, I think if you have a wet basement, it really devalues your home and can potentially lead to mold and other problems in your home. So it's definitely worthwhile getting any basement water situations taken care of as soon as you can so you don't risk your health. But anyway, that's something that we had done. And what we what they ended up doing, um, the, the thing is our basement, our foundation was dug too low and there's not enough grade to get water from under our house out to the ditches besides the road. So um, we had a sump pump, but like if it was heavy rain, um, we would still, we'd still get some flooding because water would come in from the corner where I am, it would come in over here and our sump pumps on the other side of the, um, of the basement. So what this company did, and I should probably just say fast forward like five minutes in case you have no wet basement, but what this company did was they came in and they, um, they basically dug a trench against the, on the, on the floor against the foundation walls, um, and they put down pipes and crushed rock, and that would divert any moisture um, around the perimeter. It's called a perimeter drain around the perimeter of the basement down to the sump pump. So as long as we had power on or we have a generator on, we don't have to worry about any flooding. Um, the cases where we've lost power, we actually, before we had a generator, had a bilge pump, which is like a pump you would use in a boat, and you could like hand crank the water out of your basement, which was wonderful. So much better than trying to like lift buckets of water and take them outside. But the only place the water is coming in is into the sump pump pit. Where the where, so it wouldn't be coming in randomly throughout the basement. So the first step is make sure you have a dry area. You don't want to try doing this if you've got most moisture problems because then your supplies will um, absorb a lot of that moisture and start smelling musty. A lot of our craft supplies are porous. We've got paper, we've got fabric, we've got yarn, we've got felt. And um, let's say like five years down, down the road, you decide oh, I don't I don't want to use fabric anymore. I'm going to donate it. If that fabric smells musty. Nobody's going to be able to use it if your paper smells. I mean, you could wash it and donate it, I guess, but paper, you won't be able to wash and donate. It would just kind of go bad. And things like that could actually pick up mildew and uh, and just get kind of yucky. So, uh, so you, before you decide to move your supplies downstairs, please make sure you have the moisture under control. So as long as you don't have visible water in your basement, the next thing you want to do is... Um, Think about the moisture in the air. You generally want it um, like under 40%. 
uh, I know some places like around the world have like really high humidity and their average like even in their house air is higher than that but I aim for 40 around 40 or under and um, I never get a musty smell or on anything here in my basement and so I have two different things that I use for that one I have a dehumidifier and that actually um, vents out or not vents but drains out into the sump pump and so I try to remember to run that when I'm not filming in the summer as long as I don't have like the windows open because obviously it would be drawing air I think from the outside and if I have windows in the bulkhead open and stuff I just let the air circulate but if it's all shut up then I'll um, I'll run the dehumidifier just to as a little bit of insurance to keep the humidity down it's kind of like an air conditioner really because it takes the humidity out of the air I guess if you were in, in an attic and you were having some moisture problems running an air conditioning unit would help with that if you had one and in the winter, as you can hear my, my space heater, that puts out a dry heat and that also whisks away some of the, just kind of dries up some of the uh, moisture in the air. I, I know if you, if you know, just being in, um, in Maine, we run the heat, we either have the furnace or the wood stove on and you know, your skin gets dry, you're always using ham cream because there's not that moisture in the air. So that's something that you want to do is try to remove as much moisture as possible and just make sure you have ventilation and you have circulation of air. So that that's opening a window, that's um, making sure your basement isn't shut up all the time. Uh, you could run a fan if you're in a warm climate and you want to, although basements do seem to be a northern thing. And I asked some of you guys and you said that the the land is really hard in the um, in the south and it's difficult to dig or there's a lot of boulders and it just, it's very expensive to put a basement in. And also um, the water table, like some of the coastal towns, you're just, you're, you're you're too below sea level, or too at sea level, or not high enough to be able to put a basement without getting a lot of water in. So um, I know this is probably going to be pretty specific for um, North America, Canada, but hopefully some of these tips will help you if you if you're using a shed or something like that. So a space heater, you can bring something like that to a, a shed as well. When you're running a space heater, the thing you want to keep in mind is you need to plug it directly into an outlet. Don't run it off a power strip, or it will um, it'll burn out the power strip. It'll it, and it could cause a fire. So you want that direct directly on a, um, a reputable power outlet. I have a, I don't know if you can see it behind me, can you see this? I have a heavy duty uh, extension cord and that's what I plug my power strip, my, uh, not my power strip, that's what I plug my space heater into because I can't quite easily reach the outlet back there. So that just makes sure that I always have that and I always know to pl unplug that when I'm done for the day. Even though your space heater is perfectly safe, uh, usually to leave plugged in. I don't take chances. I unplug it at the end of the day. Um, and I oftentimes will come downstairs and check. And one time I checked and it was on and I don't know if the furnace was on so I didn't hear it running or what, but I kind of had a little bit of a heart attack there. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I almost went to bed with that on. Um, and it probably would have been absolutely fine, but you know, I'm definitely a better safe than sorry type of person. Um, and so when you're using a space heater, if you're finding that you have too big of an open area because if you're in an unfinished basement, you don't have insulation. So you've probably got like a big open space and it's very difficult to heat a big open space. So what I recommend doing is when it's cold out, um, try to find a localized area for you to work. So right here is my little bench. I'm actually getting ready for a, this is, um, let me know if you find this interesting. I am going through my computer open. I've actually been looking at all the skin tone marker sets. I have quite a few from the cheaper brands that have popped up on Amazon lately over the past couple of years um, that are surprisingly good. I also have, um, you know, some pro markers and Prismacolors and whatnot, and I'm just kind of doing research to see what's in their skin tone sets, just to see what st skin tone set might be best and compare them because it seems like a lot of people uh, have a real problem finding skin tones for their alcohol markers. So you can let me know if you're interested in that or not, but that's what I've been working on. That's why I have all kinds of markers scattered about. But I find that if I'm working in an area like a table, if I have the space heater pointed to me at the table, it kind of catches all that heat and I can stay a lot warmer when I'm working. I am the type of person that's really spleeny and I get really easily affected by the cold. Um, so if I'm warm enough to work like with bare hands, then you'll probably be fine because I'm probably the spleeniest person I know. The other thing that if I'm working on my big table where I used to film mostly, um, I'll show you what I do there. I'm just going to move the camera really quick. Okay, so I, this is my table right here. This is the tabletop right right there. My ring's hitting it, so that's the tabletop. So typically when I'm working, a lot of the time I'm standing on the other side of the table and filming down. And so what I will do is I'll move this rolly cart. This is just my, uh, my embellishment storage and different doodad storage here. I'll roll that out of the way. 
I'll move that um, trash can that's there. And then so I would be standing, my legs would be over there. See where those white cupboards are? My legs would be standing on the anti-fatigue mat there, which is another tip if you're working on a cement floor, have an anti-fatigue mat. Um, Cause you know, the time can fly when you're creating. It could be four hours later and you've been standing in the same position and your legs are sore. So if you have an anti-fatigue mat, that's gonna help so that you don't have, um, I don't know, I guess like you could get varicose veins and stuff like that if you're standing on, um, on cement for too long. Uh, so then what I do is I just roll the space heater underneath and that keeps me nice and toasty as I'm working. So that's something that, uh, just to consider, to see if you can focus your heat somewhere to make you comfortable. So if you're sitting, uh, maybe you're in a shed and you're working, if you have like a, even if it's like a folding table, you could put your space heater under the table. You could drape it with a tablecloth while you're working. Just make sure the cloth isn't gonna be touching the space heater, but that can help trap the heat as well. Just please, please make sure you unplug your space heater when you're done so you don't have any risk of fire. You don't want fabric really around the space heater, but um, if you have it kind of pushed in, you have the like a tablecloth down and you're there and you're you know keeping an eye on it, I think you'll be fine. I also keep a fire extinguisher down here just in case. I've never had to use it, but I have it in case I need it. So um, that's another thing I would recommend just because, you know, craft stuff can be flammable. Might as well just have a space heater. That is, um, that's how I stay warm while I'm working. And that's probably my biggest challenge working in the basement is staying warm and comfortable. I also layer up. So like I have a sweatshirt. That's why you always see like either gray or blue sleeves. It's cause I have like, um, or, you know, I have a sweater or a sweatshirt or something on over a long sleeve shirt just to stay nice and warm. And I find wearing loose layers like this, I mean, it's not the most uh, fashionable thing in the world, but having those baggy layers helps trap heat and keep you warmer. And that's really going to be effective if you're working outside or if you're going out to plein air paint um, out in nature and you want to make sure you're going to stay warm. Having those baggy layers will really help so it can trap some uh, heat in the winter or if it's too hot, you can like remove some layers and it can let air circulate and stuff. So, um, so there's another tip for you. Another issue you're going to have working in a basement is lighting. So I'm going to show you a couple things that I use that is really handy. Now, if you're like me and you're in an unfinished basement, you have ceiling joists that are so easy to attach lighting to. So that way you don't have cords and things like that to trip over. You could also use standalone lights. You can find very inexpensive lighting rigs on Amazon if you're looking to get like a really nice three-point lighting for your workspace or because you like to do videos of your artwork. Um, I have one by Limo Studio, but I don't like the stands because I tend to trip on them. Uh, so I really like to take the hardware store, uh, what do you call them? hardware store clamp lights like this one right here I take them and put uh, daylight CFLs in them and that works really well I also have an LED and that's actually pointing at my face right now but I'm going to move the camera so you can see it this can be put around to pretty much any angle you want and hopefully it won't blind you but it's like a it's like a ring and you know I can I can tip it down but I can also change the warmth and the coolness of the light if I if I need to match something else another light or if I'm just like my eyes are tired and I want to have a warmer cooler light it works really well this one actually has a magnifier on it so I can if I'm doing like a botanical or something where I really want to zoom in maybe I'm doing some beading that is really helpful now I wanted to show you the ceiling joists here because there you can see I have a light hooked to the joist. I also have a stick that I has a thumb screw on there that I hook my camera to. You can spin around here. I've got a power strip and now your basement probably won't have as many outlets as you want. I recommend using power strips, especially for all these lights because then you can just flick the power strip off at the end of the day and you can have all of that light turned off and I can light my table. Oh, I really should have cleaned up my table before I did that. But you can kind of see how it is. Also shop lights work really well. I've got a four foot shop light over there. Um, they just plug into the wall. There's no installation. It's very easy. Um, and then you can replace those bulbs very inexpensively when you need to. But they last a long time so you probably won't need to replace them but I really like the power strip idea because I am someone who likes to know Ooh, my camera is going crazy I like to know that my everything's powered down I don't I'm always nervous about 
Um, things catching on fire. I don't know why I'm so nervous about that, but I am. So knowing that I'm shutting that power strip off that's got my heat gun plugged into it. I also like the convenience of leaving things plugged in. Um, I can shut that power strip off and not worry about it. So that's great. The only thing you don't want to put on the power strip is your space heater that needs to go directly into your wall outlet. Um, otherwise you'll burn right through it and you could cause a fire. So be safe. That's like my number one tip is just be safe where you create. Um, the nice thing also about the ceiling joist is that you can get some storage in there. I've seen people put like bins that like pull down between this the the floor joists or I guess you'd I guess they're technically floor joists but they're in your ceiling if you're in the basement so I'll call them ceiling joists um that's great storage I do my tapes I put my tapes up there duct tape masking tape packing tape let's like turn the camera here you don't have to worry about them getting dusty because they're a non-porous thing so you can just wipe them down if they get dusty, no big deal. And it keeps them visible so you can see what you have and really easy to access. And they're not really taking up any valuable space. So um, so that's really handy. Oh, so extreme close up, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I just pretty much use this space just like any other crafter with their craft room. I just try to um, make the, the things that would be negative be a positive, like using, putting nails on the joist so you can hang things and, um, and whatnot. But hopefully that's given you some different ideas on how to arrange your space. Hopefully I have enough light over here. Um, I, you see my cat actually <laughs> reaches up and scratches and stretches on this. So there are cat scratches on here. Sorry about that. But I wanted to show you that my desk is actually made from two of the inexpensive um, cubby units. You can find them at Home Depot or Target, Walmart, any of your big box stores will sell them. I have one here, one on the other end, and a door over it, and so that gives me lots and lots of storage. Now, the thing you want to be careful with when you are working in a basement or some places where you might have some moisture issue is this type of material, this MDF material, is kind of like a, it's almost like they took sawdust and pressed it into a board, and that is very susceptible to moisture. So you really want to be careful when you're using that type of material because um, if it gets wet, it can basically disintegrate. So what I have here, if you can see on my floor, this is just a cheap synthetic uh, rug from, I think it was probably from Staples, or it's an office, like an office quality rug. It's very low pile, very easy to vacuum. I mean, hey, there's paint spilled on it and some glitter and duct tape, but I'm not going to worry about this getting ruined because this is my studio, this is where I work. Um, I don't want to have to be scared to drop something because I've just ruined an expensive carpet. So this works for me. But the other thing that's nice about this is that it, um, I'm going to look on the bottom of it. It's got kind of like a, like a plasticky mesh on the bottom and it, the fabric itself is synthetic. So it creates a nice, uh, nice moisture barrier. So even though this is sitting directly on the cement on top of this carpet, I'm not getting any of the, um, I'm not getting any mildew, any, um, salt coming up from the ground. I'm not getting any sort of uh, moisture onto those cabinets that could potentially ruin it. And I have had that happen with some like scrapbook cubes and it's such a shame because you get this kind of gross, it just looks like kind of like dirt. Um, maybe it is wet dirt. I don't know. Wet dust. I don't know. But it, I think it's, I think it's more than likely like a mildew or something that because the cement is so porous, the moisture can just wick right up into anything that is, um, that's made of cardboard or paper or even wood, but especially the MDF stuff because of how it's kind of made from wood that's already been broken down into like sawdust. It just seems to absorb so much better. Uh, and that's not what you want. You don't want your stuff to fall apart or get musty or mildewy. You want moisture free air, moisture free supplies. You don't need to be breathing in any mildew or mold or anything. So just kind of keep that in mind. You don't want anything that's made of um, like the MDF on your cellar floor. I want to talk about the safety of your materials. Now, generally, if you're comfortable in a space, your materials are going to be fine. But if you're working in a shed that is unheated outdoors in an area of the country that um, gets below freezing, you'll want to take care to not leave your glues and acrylic products, acrylic paints, things like that exposed. Because anytime those types of products freeze, they may kind of chunk up and cure and never be usable again. So you just want to make sure that if you're storing things like glues and paints that you have um, at least above freezing. Now this 
area here gets down to, I think the lowest I ever saw it was about 50. And um, that's fine. That's not going to harm any of my supplies. But if you were having, say, like a like a storage shed that you were using, like maybe it's real comfortable and breezy and beautiful in the summer, you wouldn't want to leave your stuff out there in the winter. Even if you're going out there to work and you're heating it while you're there, you definitely would want to bring those supplies back inside to your living environment with you, maybe in a toolbox or something like that, so you don't end up ruining it. Just like if you went to a paint class with your acrylic paints, you wouldn't leave your um, paints in the car overnight if it was going to get below freezing. It's also a good reason not to order acrylic paints or glues in the middle of winter if between your house and the place that you're buying them from is uh, is in the freeze zone because they will get ruined. Um, or they could potentially get ruined if they're in an unheated truck. So it's just something to keep in mind because you spend a lot of money on these supplies and you don't want to let them get ruined. The last thing I want to talk about is about your safety. And if you're working in a basement, I highly recommend that you get it tested for radon, especially if you're not in the habit of opening the windows and having a lot of air circulate through. Um, there's an inexpensive test you can buy at any of the home improvement centers like Lowe's or Home Depot. And what you do is you set the radon test. There's instructions with it, so you don't have to remember what I'm telling you. Do what the instructions that come with your say, but you basically, um, it's, it's like a little cartridge. You set it in the middle of your basement, you close everything up, you make sure every window's closed, every door is closed, um, and you leave it sealed up for a couple days. Uh, so that way, if there's any radon gases coming in through your foundation, uh, that, that, tester can pick them up and then you mail that back to the radon testing company and they will get back to you via well it was via mail back when I did it but it might be email now um and they'll tell you what your radon levels were if there or if there are any radon levels how bad they are and what you need to do for mitigation if it's right on the borderline they might just say like keep your windows open or you know you might have to put a sensor in so if it's over a certain point you open up windows and you let things um, air out or you might actually have to put a radon mitigation system in if you have a, um, a more serious level of radon and that I think tends to be in more areas where you have a lot of boulders and ledge and that could be another reason why they don't put basements in a lot of those um, states that are more ledgy and bouldery not to mention the expense and also probably the radon risk um, but that's just something that you want to take care of if you're going to be spending a lot of time in your basement and um, I'm probably just I am a worry wart, so I'm probably a little bit overcautious, but I'd rather be safe than sorry, especially if I'm giving you guys advice. I certainly don't want any of you to get sick um, over something silly. So, uh, so there's that. Yeah, just make sure that if you're storing paper, um, I'll show you how I store my paper. I store my large sheets of 22 by 30 inch watercolor paper uh, in a flat file under my bed. I don't risk them down here just because there is some fluctuation between summer and winter. It fluctuates from from like, um, I would say probably 68 degrees to about 52 degrees typically. So I, I just don't want to have that fluctuation on my really expensive paper. But I'll show you the other two ways I do store my paper. I'm going to pause the video because I, I have to turn on some more lights. So I'll be right back. Okay, I'm scooching down because I'm kind of out of the frame. Are we rolling? Good. Okay, so I keep my easel right here because it kind of covers up this corner, which is kind of a bit of a mess. Um, but... I'm going to move this out of the way so I can show you what's back here. So right here, I have a bookshelf and I have uh, my watercolor papers up top and I keep the pads pulled out just enough so that they're not touching that back wall because I don't want moisture from that back wall wicking into my paper. At least I hope I've kept, the, kept them back for enough. I think I have because I don't have any like any yuckiness on the edges. So I try to keep that pulled back away from the wall enough and that's how I'm storing all of my paper pads that are below 9 by 12 size. And then I've got um, some books here on the bottom shelves. And that was, these actually were upstairs in my office, but um, we're doing some remodeling. So I needed to clear everything out of my office. That's why I'm working down here in the basement during the cold times. I generally would bring my supplies upstairs and work in my office. So there's another tip I want to share with you. Um, let me grab one of the bins that I have. I have these, um, they're letter size bins. I picked them up at the Dollar Tree. And what I do is I use them to store my supplies. Well, not really store my supplies. I use them to pull materials that I need for a specific project. And that way, if it's too chilly to work down here, I can take that basket upstairs with me. I'll grab one real quick to show you. I'm very self-conscious because I'm wearing this like, you know, oversized grumpy, frumpy old sweatshirt. Um, <laughs> uh, what's new, right? I mean, hey, 
you, we've been friends long enough, haven't we? Um, so like I have all these different like sewing themed things in this tray. So what I can do is I can take this tray either over to my table where it's toasty because I got my space heater, or I can take them upstairs to the kitchen table, or if I want to craft with some friends, I can you know take it with me. Um, so I definitely recommend putting all your stuff from one project into a uh, tray like this, and that way you can go craft somewhere that's more comfortable in your home where you don't need to have everything. You can just put what you need in here and take it to your kitchen table or your coffee table or wherever so um, you can be around your family. Because one thing that I will warn you may be a problem for you working in the basement or someplace where you're kind of annexed from the rest of your family is that you might feel like you're missing out. And um, if you have a child to care for, if you have a parent to care for, a spouse to care for, then you may need to be within earshot. And this may be very impractical, but you may not have any other place to store your belongings. So having trays like this where you can, when you have like 45 minutes or you don't even need that much time, when you have some time and you th think up an idea, you can run downstairs, walk carefully, don't fall down the stairs. Um, you can put all your supplies for a project in a tray. And then when you have that bit of time, like maybe you're, um, your family is watching a football game or something, you want to be with them, but you're not that interested in the football game, you can pull up one of these project trays and you could be working, um, you know, sitting on the couch while the rest of your family is watching the football game, or if you're caring for a parent or a child and you need to be nearby in case they need you, you can bring your tray of supplies up to your table and you can work while, um, you know, while you're still available for anybody that needs you. Because that's the thing, guys, Nobody has the perfect um, amount of time to create. Nobody has a perfect studio. As much as they look perfect in magazines, that is not real life. They're, you're, you know, the magazines are fantasy. It's not real life. Everybody has different obstacles they have to work with when they are wanting to be creative. Even me, where I, I'm doing this for my profession, I still don't have ideal circumstances, and I want um, I want you to know you don't have to have ideal circumstances. You can make it work with what you have. If all you have is room for um, a chest of plastic drawers from Walmart, and you got to fit your supplies in there and just kind of tuck it underneath the kitchen table when you're not using it, that's fine. Make it work for you. Make it work for the space you have and the lifestyle that you're leading. There's no right or wrong. There's no perfect. Um, and don't try to make it perfect. Make it work for you now. It might not be your ideal. It might not be where you're going to be in 10 years. But make it work for you now so you can actually enjoy creating um, now, in the time that you have now. So hopefully it gave you some ideas. This is an ideal but it works and I enjoy it and I'm happy to have this space. And if you've got some space that you can claim as your own in your home, then do it, grab it and make it yours and make something awesome. I know you can do it. I know you can do it. If you have any tips, let me know in the comments below. I don't have a she shed. I don't have an attic that is, our attic is just like a crawl space for, um, for Christmas decorations. But if you have a non-conventional space that's worked really well for you or you're working in part of a shared space, let us know in the comments below so you can help other people that are struggling with the same situations that you are. Uh, everybody has great tips to share and everyone has different experiences, lives in different parts of the world, has different obstacles. So all of that information is really useful to share with others. Thanks again so much for watching and see you next time. Bye.